Cash Flow Diary Podcast, Episode 42. Congratulations, you showed up. Give yourself a high five in celebration of your success. Welcome to the Cash Flow Diary, where new and experienced investors come to take confident action towards their goals. Your host is a family man, a real estate entrepreneur, investor, coach, and instructor. As a master facilitator of Robert Kiyosaki's Cash Flow 101 game, he's inspired many to begin their journey into creating cash flow for themselves and their family. And now, here he is to offer you the tools required to earn the income desired. Your cash flow coach, Jay Massey. Okay, have you been ever been so excited about something that you just couldn't wait to do it? <laughs> and that's kind of what's happened. I had an interview uh, that I wanted to share with you immediately. It's like right after I did it, I was like, oh man, we've got to have this go live now. Because the information and the individual who I interviewed was, it was just so timely. It was so right. And it made so much sense uh, that I wanted to share it with you. So I'm launching our episode um, and our series a little bit early uh, in the week, simply because I, it was that important to me. I was that excited about it. And when my team heard it, they were excited about it. So I think you're going to be excited about it too. Make sure that you, you know, listen and move at the speed of instruction and do the things that you know you need to do in order to make the stuff that you hear happen. Now, there was also another reason uh, that I wanted to make sure that we got this to you. Some of you already know, uh, but many of you may not have had an opportunity yet to go over to Learn Investing Now or raise, RaisingPrivateCapital.com. We're in the process of doing, uh, or I'm about to launch actually, a new mastermind group. Last time I did a mastermind group, you know, it was simply on the concept of wholesaling, and many individuals were able to gather that information, use that information, and go out there and, and transact business using none of their own money or credit, going out there to be able to do deals. Um, part of what happened for some of them is that they started getting involved in deals that were larger than they felt comfortable with because they didn't know how to get the money. Well, now, many people say to me, Jay, how do I raise capital? Now you have an opportunity to learn. Go over to learninvestingnow.com. Get signed up for uh, the mastermind group because it will be starting very, very soon. All right. So don't delay. And then the next thing that I was excited about was the fact that, you know, this particular podcast I love doing. I'm going to keep doing it. Uh, we've also launched an daily podcast as well. So go over to Cashflow Diary Dailies, Cashflow Diary Daily. Uh, we get lots of, I've got lots of content and I, I it, it takes a while to get some of it out. And, and I've done a number of speaking engagements, a number of live events, and there's just so much, you know, stuff that we have in the archives. We figured that one way to get more of it out to you faster is to create a second podcast. So do me a favor, leave a review on this one, go over to the other one, download that one, leave a review there too, because here's the thing. If you like it, others will like it. If you leave a review, they'll likely listen. And I want to help and get in front of as many people who are looking for this type of information as possible. Thanks. All right, and welcome to another episode of the CashflowDiary.com podcast. Glad that you are here. Hopefully you are enjoying the series that we're currently doing. Uh, finding great entrepreneurs all around the world even uh, who have found different ways to create cash flow, doing the things that they love, uh, putting their own passions into action, and making uh, a difference in the world. And that's one of the greatest things about being an entrepreneur is that you get to solve problems. Many of you, you've heard me say that before, but you, you solve the problems that you want to solve and in the ways that you are uniquely skilled at solving them. And that's one of the, the funnest parts of, of being an entrepreneur is figuring out how, uh, A, what problem you can solve, how you can solve it, and what makes you unique in solving so. And one of the things that is is often a challenge, you know, that many of us entrepreneurs face is how do we get everything done? <laughs> you know, how do you get everything done? And one of the greatest things that I, I learned a long time ago is that wealth is a team sport. And then it, it, with that being the case, you only have to decide what position you want to play. And, and today I've got with me an individual 
who I believe you're going to enjoy. I mean, and just the 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 times that I've been able to speak with him, I we can get going down, you know, tangents just about a very passionate subject because it's so crucial to be successful uh, with what he has to say so that you can get your cause, your mission, your company's vision actually realized. And, you know, one of the things that I, I hope you take away from this uh, conversation is how you have the ability uh, to do whatever it is you want. You just have certain skill sets that you need to gain. And the, the gentleman today is definitely qualified to help you and myself and everybody be able to get better at what it is that we're trying to do. Uh, I have with me today a gentleman by the name of Mr. Eric Kaufman. He is known uh, for guiding leaders to make better decisions and achieve better results. That's awesome. Native of Israel, lived and worked in South Africa, gaining two decades of experience in sales. That's 20 years. Okay, so now you're going to have access to 20 years worth of experience just in this episode, uh, but not just in sales, but in management leader and leadership with many different uh, very large companies, uh, specifically 3M. And he's also worked as a consultant with Sony, T-Mobile, Gentech, Alcon Labs, and a whole bunch of other Fortune 1000 companies. But here's the part that makes him so interesting to me. Along with his real-world business experience, he, he, he's got a range of other skills. And understand, guys, that the magic sauce for many of us is in those other skills. Um, but he has the ability, obviously, to, to be a great keynote speaker, does management consulting, clinical hypnotherapist. Now, here's where it gets really fun. Master scuba diving and instructor, adjunct professor of leadership and coaching at San Diego State University, and a speaker with Vistage International. Now, watch this. He's also been a lifelong practitioner of Zen meditation who once spent a year in silent meditation. A whole year. That's amazing to me. Living in a cabin he built himself in the mountains of New Mexico. I hope you are ready to hear Mr. Eric Kaufman. Eric, you there? I'm here, Jay. This is awesome. You, uh, you, I, Okay, I got to start with probably what most people want to know. How on earth do you spend one year in silent meditation in a cabin you build yourself? It's um, it wasn't easy, honestly. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I'd never I'd never built. Uh, I, I you know I didn't grow up in a construction family. I didn't have a lot of experience in construction, but I I've been practicing a meditation practice while working, and this went on for about eleven or twelve years. And and there just came a point where I thought, okay, I I I. I wasn't married. I didn't have children. I had some flexibility and mobility, and I thought, I really want to know what it's like to completely, utterly, and without any distraction, dedicate myself to a meditation practice. Because I, you know, I've been doing it I mean, intensely for 11 years, 12 years. But I was also going to work. I was rising through the career ladder. I was in relationships, etc. And so I thought, well, what would be a way to do it that would really hit the spot? And so. I decided to go all out or all in, depending on how you want to look at it, and um, I quit my job. I liquidated my 401k, took all my cash, donated it, so I gave it all away so I wouldn't be attached to anything. I shaved my head, and I went up to New Mexico where some friends of mine had a property up there, and I spent three months, literally three months every single day, building this 625-square-foot cabin, so that was sort of, you know, Challenge one, challenge two, challenge three, and then I sort of walked in and in January, closed the door, and stayed there for a year. I had friends, those same friends who would bring me food and and uh, check in just to make sure I hadn't expired. Very, very glad they did that. Wow. But um, but that that was the mechanics of it. But the um, the uh, the actual experience had different phases. You know, there was excitement. Oh, what am I? You know, it's so cool. And then there was this profoundly deep depression that took over me about month three into it where I suddenly realized I was all alone and uh, I was still unhappy. I was still frustrated. I was still blaming other people and there was nobody there to blame. It, it became, Jay, a very interesting moment to realize that I was the creator of my life, that I was the writer of the story. I was the author of the play. You know, I was the one who was shaping, crafting, and forming this experience and I wasn't happy with the experience, and there was no body to blame. And I think that put me into a real deep depression that lasted a couple months as I kind of sat with nobody to process this reality 
and then through the practices and the meditation, you, you know, found a way to, to, to be graceful with myself, to accept the unacceptable, to, uh, to embrace the totality of who I am. And, and that, that began an unfolding process that allowed me to stay true. And the reason I left after a year is because around a year, I had this uh, unexpected revelation that I, I really should get married have children and uh, and uh, engage in a business that serves a larger community. That it wasn't okay to be isolated and and, and uh, restricted from people. So, so that's when I left that phase and, and came back and started. You know, got you know found a, a woman who was kind enough, clever enough, and courageous enough to be my wife. <laughs> but, yes. But, uh, yeah, it was it was an intense experience. Indeed, indeed. Now. The title of your book is Leadership as a Hero's Journey, and it sounds like you're sharing with us a little bit a part of your own journey. Uh, what would you say, if, if I asked you, uh, what would you say your your book is about when it comes to you know leadership as a hero's journey? Because it sounds like not only that experience, but all the other experiences combined, sounds like you've got some interesting stuff to share. Uh Fundamentally, the book is about creation. Uh, it's about this very important evolutionary journey that we have to take on as human beings to move away from the familiar, away from the known, away from the rehearsed, and to some degree outdated, and uh, move towards the creation of, of, of a full expression of what our life means. And and, and more practically, it's about the, the four virtues that I've seen play out over and over, both in history, in religion, in business, in psychology. There are these four virtues that allow you, allow me, allow us to traverse this unknown and unfamiliar path and create a life and outcome that is both meaningful to us and productive to the society. You know, what I, was, what I found interesting as I was going through, specifically in the introduction and something you just said, was the the whole creation process how when you're by yourself with no one else to blame you you were creating what you were in a sense all of the reality that you were experiencing and what what i really like is is the part where you talk about how you know a thought is a thing you are what you think you become what you think about most and and you stress you know that that we have an element of control and influence in this process what would you say to the person who's who's out there? I mean, you've had the, the corporate nine to five job and you found something that you're passionate about to help you and, and help other people. But how can how can I practically apply, you know, those principles, this being one of them that, that you talk about? How can I practically do that today? Uh, one, one of the one of the first elements of these, um, of all these principles, right? There's lots and lots of books and teachers and authors. You are, I am. There are many, many, many of us in this tribe, whether formal or informal. But, but I think uh, underlying all of our efforts is to help facilitate for other people a better experience of their life. And um, so one of the fundamental elements about that is, is, is insight or awareness. I have to be aware of the current content. I mean, it's one thing to say, here's my goal, here's my vision, and that's real critical. I'm not, I'm not saying that uh, with any disregard. It is very important to say, what is the desired outcome that you want? Right. But then we have to do a, a real gut check and say, what do I currently have? And what I currently have is a reflection of what I currently believe, and what I currently believe is, is, is a contributor to what I'm thinking about on an ongoing basis. Now, to your point, I write that a thought is a thing, you are what you think, you become what you think about most. So if you, I thought of a thing, this is not an academic idea, it's a practical idea, and how do we know that? So if you think about somebody that you love, typically, you start feeling warmth in your chest, the smile comes to your face, you know, the world looks a little bit brighter. If you think about, you know, your financial troubles, because, you, you know, your creditors are after you and you don't know how you're going to cover your, your mortgage, your stomach gets tight, the world looks a little meaner, and people look suspicious. And, and the difference there is the quality, the content, of the thought. So a thought is a thing. Things are things. Things are sort of, you can tell when something exists because it has an impact and influence that has a pressure on its environment. And if I think a positive thought, like somebody that I love, I feel good. So that thought has an impact. Therefore, it's a thing. I mean, do you follow that logic? A thought is an actual thing. Absolutely. And, 
and and what you are is you are the the uh, you know you are what you think and you become what you think about most. And so, what people can do right away is not begin to change their thoughts because that's what you know we've been taught for for decades through a lot of these personal development programs is just choose a mantra, choose an affirmation, and dangulate that affirmation. And maybe you've done it. I know I have. And they have varying degrees of success, but usually there's some level of frustration saying, wow, I've been saying this affirmation 10,000 times, and I'm not remarkably different than I was before. What's right. up? It's because it, while I'm saying that affirmation consciously, <clears throat> I continue to, underneath that affirmation, affirm the old thoughts that are creating the reality that I'm experiencing right now. So what I propose is, I thought of the thing, first and foremost, you have to become aware of what you're thinking. So... As situations arise, it is becoming an observer to your own inner dialogue and listening with curiosity rather than with animosity. Because a lot of times, a lot of us, when we take on these affirmations, there's an element of animosity. And what I mean by that, Jay, is that I don't like who I am. I don't like my experience. I don't like what's going on. And and as long as I don't like it, I want to push it away. I want to get rid of it. Now, If you want to get rid of somebody, they're typically offended, they're hurt. They are either going to skulk away or they're going to fight you. If you turn that into an inward sort of reflection and think about if I don't like an aspect of me, if I want to push an aspect of me away, if I want to, you know, remove an aspect of me, that aspect becomes defensive and holds on tighter. I I hope that makes sense at some level. Absolutely. I, I, I get it. I, I I feel like I get it. I feel like I understand it. I feel like I've been through this process, although not consciously. I mean, you, that that I guess that's kind of the benefit of you know uh, of your book is you can now go through it in a, in a conscious state. Because I can remember not long ago, um, one of the the mantras that you were you were referring to and exercises that I did, and and I, I think about this um, is one of the first things that I was uh, instructed to do was to say, state how much I wanted to earn on a monthly basis. And then I use that one sentence in three different ways. I I would say, you know, I want to earn $10,000 a month. He earns $10,000 a month. And then Jay earns $10,000 a month. Now, when you first do that, when I was first doing that, um, and when you said it subconsciously at the same time, it, all the, any negative neuro associations that I had to the idea of earning a, what I thought was a a lot of money on a monthly basis would instantly come up and be part of what I would say. I would say, you know, I earn $10,000 a month and instantly I would be antagonistic with my own self and go, no, you don't, you can't do that. (laughs) And it, it was just weird and funny to hear you quantify what I've, what I remember in, in a very succinct way. Um, but, you know, having persevered through that process is it's very, very key. And, you know, I, I tell people often that real estate is no different in any business. Real estate is just like any other business where you can develop cash flow. And it, nobody has a, a money problem. We all have an idea problem. And adjusting those ideas is, is what you're talking about so that you can actually make uh, forward progress towards the things that you're looking for. Uh, in in this experience, that's that's exactly right. And and what I'm proposing that might be a little bit different than some of some of the formulas that are out there is when those antagonistic or, or negative or subconscious or deeper thoughts arise, that the the path towards this evolutionary path, the the, the hero's journey's path, is not necessarily to then do battle with that inner negative voice. <laughs> yeah, that's antagonistic. But rather to be curious about it to be curious about it and to be curious about it takes more courage than it does to just fight it off because the courage is to stand there and come face to face with our own internal limitations and fears. And because that's really what it's coming down to. It's coming down to whatever particular modality of fear that's ours, whether it's fear of rejection or whether it's fear of humiliation or whether it's fear of failure, loss of control we have these, these, these sort of primordial fears and they play out in different ways for different people. And when these negative or antagonistic or limiting thoughts come up, to me the interesting thing is not just to push them away and say your affirmation or mantra even louder, but rather to pause 
and courageously face that negative thought. Because the more you face it, the more you come close to it, the more you understand it, the more you can embrace it, the less pressure it has on you in the long term. This is a little bit counterintuitive. It doesn't mean you're not focusing on the $10,000 a month that he, you, Jay, is, is deserving. But it means that when the negativity, when the limitation shows itself, we don't just overwhelm it with noise. We embrace it. And over time, things that you embrace become part of you, and they, they stop trying to limit you. Totally. So that's, that's a different way to add to the general you know, familiar state of fighting it. It's not about fighting it. It's about learning to bring it into the totality of your experience and reduce its influence over you. Okay. Now, right about now, you're like, no, I don't want to hear you, Jay. I want the interview to keep going. Well, we got to go through our cash flow question, and I'll promise I'll be fast. All right. So um, for those of you who may not know, the, the cash flow question is just an opportunity for you uh, to send in your answers uh, to the questions if you want an opportunity to win my upcoming book, Cash Flow Creation System, uh, that I go through my entire business model, my entire business model inside the book. Uh, if you want to send in answers to the questions, it's 800-689-1764, 800-689-1764. Or if you would prefer email, feel free to send in your answers to cashflowquestion at cashflowdiary.com. Um, all right. Last week's question uh, was, in which year was the Federal Reserve created? In which year was the Federal Reserve created? The U.S. Federal Reserve, uh, which is not federal, has no money, <laughs> and kind of doesn't really belong to the U.S., but that's a whole nother story. Um, the answer is 1913. 1913. This week's question, you're going to notice the theme. Where is it reported that the Federal Reserve was created. Where was it reported that the Federal Reserve was created? There's a specific location, geographic location that I'm looking for. Send in your answers to 800-689-1764, 800-689-1764, or cashflowquestion at cashflowdiary.com. Now I'll get you back to the interview. Indeed, I... I I love this so much. In fact, one of the things that used to get on my nerves a, a ton was when I would hear people say that you 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 know you you can't be afraid, and I'm like, you no. Know, learning to understand my own fears is part of the reasons why I can help people now because I understand the fears that they're going with, but more importantly, the fears that the, a seller may have in terms of negotiations, and it helps me communicate with people just by being able to relate to them. So I'm kind of curious where you would, what you would say to someone who is maybe they're looking at, you know, the, starting their business by writing their first offer. Maybe they're, they're in the process of, you know, de, they think they want to do an iPhone app. They think they want to, they heard about this thing called cash flow, and they're like, man, I want some of that, but I'm too afraid. What, what would you say their response should be? I, I, I like what you said. This idea of fearlessness is is remarkably ridiculous. It makes for sexy advertising. It makes for good slogans. It sells books because all of us have fear. And so if anyone says to me, be fearless and I'll teach you how to be fearless, that's very attractive. The reality is it's ridiculous. There is no possibility of being fearless. The issue is not about having no fear. The issue is about developing courage, cultivating courage. Fear is biological. Every animal, every organism reacts in a defensive way against the perceived sense of danger. That's what we call fear. Fear is a, is a response to danger. And the sheer, the sheer reality of, of being alive means that we recoil, react to perceived danger, and that's called fear. So fear is biological. It is wired into every neural pathway in our brain and cell in our body. This is not a function of being fearless. Fearless would be either somebody who's dead or lobotomized or somehow mentally ill. Neither of those is a terrific option for an investor. <laughs> I'll skip those. Yes, I agree. So, yeah. And so the question is, how can I be courageous? How can I cultivate courage? And to your point, it's unavoidable that we're going to have to face the fear. 
And there, and again, that, that's one of the four virtues that I talk about in this, is this hero's journey, leadership as a hero's journey, life as a hero's journey, is that we're not going to be without fear. The question is, how do we relate to fear? And often what we're afraid of is the various potential damage we're envisioning downstream, right? So I could lose my money, I could lose my reputation, I could lose my comfort, I could lose my relationship. It's usually a sense of something that's going to be lost. And so the idea of cultivating courage, for me, as I mentioned before, begins with willingly facing what we'd rather walk away from. And I'm not saying conquering or defeating it or removing it. I'm facing it. Half the battle is willing to just be present to and be with and embrace that which we'd rather run away from. So whether that's a relationship that's in conflict or whether that's a, a belief that is in conflict, like, you know, I want to start this. I want, to do, I want to invest, but I could lose my money. The market could go south. There's all these reasons why it could, but we have to face those reasons first. Second, and, mm-hmm. I propose that – go ahead. No, no, no. I, the, I, I like this because I, what you just hit on is, is something that I deal with uh, all the time when I'm dealing with you know, new investors and their relationships. They, they have this relationship to money and what has happened to them into the past that prevents them from taking the actions – because the, 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 the common, here's probably one of the most common things I get is, especially now, they're like, well, I had a lot of money, my 401k is now a 201k, and I've got that money back now, I've been able to make it back, but I'm afraid of it happening again, and then they can face things, they can know about things like inflation and, and, and the lack of social security and all the things that they're looking at in the future and go, well, that's so far off. It doesn't, I'm not as afraid of that as I am of losing the money today when, when you simple math will tell you you won't have enough unless you do something. And it's always just an interesting struggle to hear people how, how they're going to, to deal with it. And that becomes my question to them. It's like, I understand exactly what you're feeling. I felt feelers like that too. Many, many people do. I submit, and, and I'm very curious to hear what you'd have to say on this. I submit the difference between those who are successful and those who are not isn't, uh, as you say, a lack of fear, because I, I don't believe that either. Uh, I believe it's how they've learned how to respond to those fear instincts and what they do because when they feel them. What would you say to that? I, I, I agree completely because we all have fear. So it's a matter of how did we learn to deal with those fear instincts, to your point. And one of the things that I propose to everyone to do is to ask this very simple question. What am I really afraid of? What am I really afraid of? Because it's very rarely the surface level answer. Right? So I want to invest in this new property. I want to build a team that's going to help me flip houses because it's an opportunity now in the market. But, oh, boy, you know, the subs are unreliable. They could just walk away with my money. They could do it after, you know, they, they could be slow on their project. I could be overbilled. I could be slow to, to get it listed and lose my money. I mean, there's all these things that are real possibilities, right? These are not delusions. These are real possibilities. But that's not really what the person's afraid of. So asking yourself, what am I really afraid of, is a critical component of cultivating courage because we have to name something in order to tame it. We have to be able to relate to it in order to embrace it and change its, its influence on us. And so what am I really afraid of? And what we're really afraid of, it comes down to one of three or four things. We're afraid of failure, right? We just don't want to look bad, seem foolish, or, or lose power and control. We're afraid of rejection. We don't want to be pushed away. We don't want to lose relationship. We're afraid of humiliation. We don't want to show up as though we're stupid or incompetent in the world. And usually those three are are sort of banging around in our heads and they have their own versions in each one of us. But if I'm afraid of humiliation or rejection or failure, then I need to ask myself, well, what can I do to appease or deal with that fear? Because that's really what's going on. It's not the subs. It's not the market. It's not the rate. It's my fear that I'm going to look like an idiot. That's what I have to work on. And so uh that... That's it amazing. begins to give me a different angle than just dealing with, I'll make another plan. It's not just about another plan. It's about greater awareness. So true. It's so funny that you said that last one. I, I started smiling simply because I, I often tell everyone um, there are two things you that are, that it's impossible to do simultaneously. You can't learn something and look good 
at the same time. And because we're so busy trying to look good, we never learn um, because we don't want to look stupid. And it's it's that's just funny that that was one of the three. I had no idea that you're going to say that. Um, so this is I mean, and, and these are the very things. And, you know, people come to me and they say, well, teach me how to write an offer. And it's not even about how to write an offer. It's really it becomes a lot about how to deal with all this stuff that you're afraid of. And uh, I'm, I just love it. And then and, and the, the people who overcome that are the ones that end up, you know, uh, the ones that end up owning the properties and taking the next steps and starting their businesses and developing cash flow, et cetera, et cetera. And, and I find it interesting how willing you are to question and you're asking us to question um, those very things. In fact, I, I'm going to start questioning more because, you know, from that discovery process, this awareness, I can actually do something about it. You know, if I'm not aware of it, I can't. Right. And, and there's, there's a couple other things we can talk about also practically for cultivating that fear, because just naming it is one. And then there's a couple others. Um, not the least of which is exactly what you're doing finding supporters, allies, you know, every, every hero in every story has to face great challenges on his or her own. But every hero in every story across all cultures, across all time, have had allies. You know, it's either the magical ally or the friend or the sidekick. But the idea that we go it alone is perhaps the most debilitating of all the ideas to entrepreneurs, to leaders, and to human beings. The idea that somehow I am going to do this on my own, by myself, that I'm John Wayne, I'm going to write in, I'm going to clean out the town, and I'm going to make everything right, right. Is, uh, is, a, is, a, is a, um, it's an addiction that's not serving anyone. You know, the reality, I love what you said in the very beginning, I absolutely love it. Wealth is a team sport. And we can go even bigger than that and say success is a team sport, whether that's wealth and money, whether it's, you know, spiritual evolution, whether it's building community, Agreed. Um, wealth, success, the team sport. And this notion that we do it alone is, um, it's an immature impulse, right? If I have, I have two kids and I remember both of them when they were in their two, three years old, it was all, no, me, no, I want to do it. No, me. <laughs> and, you know, and that's fine when you're two or three or four or five years old. It's not so attractive when you're in your 20s and 30s and 40s or 50s. You know, get over it. It's, it's about working with others, including this idea of, of cultivating courage. It doesn't have to be alone. I still have to deal with it. But who's my ally? Who can I talk to? Who will advise me? Who will support me? Who will encourage me? Who will hold me accountable? That's an important contribution to this idea of cultivating courage. It does not have to be all alone. No. And and in fact, I, I say the, the weakest point is when you're by yourself, um, especially when it comes to 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 real estate. And when and because that, that's what I think about. I think about real estate a lot for obvious reasons. And, you know, uh, another manifestation of that I've seen of that is when people go to buy real estate, they'll say things like, well, I'll just buy one house. And I'm like, well, that's your riskiest position. If you had 10, the, the, the other nine can support the one if something happens. And that, you know, it's that same thought process across many different avenues. And it's that, that thought process that allows us to expand our influence. And I think, you know, that there are a number of people right now listening to you and I who have great causes, great things that they'd like to have happen, but they've got this in the way. You know, um, they've got great passion and they got great enthusiasm about what it is that they're looking for. But they have the I have to do it all by myself mentality. So let, what would you prescribe <laughs> as, a, as a way to, to stop that? Um, what, what are some is there a practical? Is there something? Is there do I got to do 50 push ups? What is it? You know, tell me, you know, how, how are we going to get over this? How are we going to get over this? Um... This, this kind of urge to do it alone? Yes. Yeah, that, it's, that's a maturation process. You know, that is, a, that is the, you know, the hero's journey. That's the evolutionary process of our life. And I think how we do it is at some point you, just, you really do have to swallow hard and reach out and ask for help. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that the folks who are willing to do So, you know, one element of it is education. People sometimes don't know that doing it on their own is a limitation. So if they listen to this program, if they listen to you, if they read my material, if, there's lots of teachers who are teaching that, um, you know, success is a team sport. Wealth is a team sport. I love that statement. 
And so getting that notion, being exposed to the idea, that's the power of education. So that's one. Then two, it becomes a matter of finding, um, uh, articulating the intention. What is it that I want to create? So to your point, you know, I, you know, Jay is, you know, he is earning ten thousand a month. Jay is earning ten thousand a month. I am earning ten thousand a month. There's a, there's an intention. There's a purpose. There's a goal. There's something you're striving for that is bigger than what you've accomplished in the past. And I think identifying that. Does two things. One is it gives you a sense of direction. Two, it raises all those fears and anxieties, right? Because suddenly you start thinking, well, no, I can't, I won't, I haven't, I, it's not possible. Those are all, that's the conversation of anxiety in your head, fear in your head. And when you have that clear desire and you have some awareness around what you're afraid of, then reaching out to someone and say, help me, becomes much more concrete, right? Help me with what? Well, help me accomplish this. How can I help you? Well, this is what's coming up for me. Any ideas on how I can overcome it? And so we have to do a little bit of pre-work in order to make ourselves available to find a good mentor, a good ally, a good teacher. And that work in part is that state your desired outcome. What is your intention? What's your goal? What's your, what is it you're trying to create? One. Two, begin to become aware of what's getting in the way. And then you have to find somebody whom you trust and whom you look up to. And the reality is that sometimes the mentor, the ally, will fall short. Sometimes a relationship doesn't work. Sometimes a person isn't who you thought they were. That's no reason not to do it again. Kind of like saying, I broke up with a girl. She broke my heart. I'm never going to be in a relationship again. <laughs> right. There's a logic to it that's not logical. You know, we are, right. I don't know if we've all gone through it, but I certainly have. I've broken up with, with girlfriends. I thought, oh, my God, I'm crushed. There's no way I can ever be in love again. And guess what? That didn't turn out to be true. So taking the small step to reach out to somebody who's familiar, who's trusted, who, 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 who I feel safe with, that's a big deal, safety. That would be the first one. I wouldn't recommend to somebody to reach out to their first mentor, to be somebody so removed and so, um, um, so distant from them, either in terms of authority or position or, 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 uh, or accomplishments, that it's hard to relate to them, right? My first allies, my first helpers ought to be people that I can feel safe with. But I, but I need to reach out saying, here's my objective, here's my goal, and here's what's going on for me. So there has to be a willingness to be somewhat vulnerable or transparent, right? I can't ask somebody to be my mentor, my helper, my ally, and then hide from them all the things that I'm struggling with. So set the objective, become aware of the inner dialogue, find somebody safe to work with, and begin to explore with them how to move forward, how to be accountable, how to be motivated, how to be encouraged. Uh, oh, my God. That is it's so funny. We get a number of emails and calls from time to time from individuals who are reaching out, you know, looking for similar help in this particular area of what we do. And occasionally they, they're wondering, why am I asking the questions about what they need help with and, and what's going on? And this is the very reason is like, I don't know what I don't know what direction. I don't know where to send you. I may not be the person you're looking for. I don't know what to tell you. You may think I'm your solution, but I may not be. We may not be. I don't know. And and this is so true when it comes to uh, a particular investment. Many times people make an investment without understanding what they want from it and, and, and how it's going to affect their life, you know, positively and or and what the potential risks are negatively. And we just go in blindly and it's bigger than we should have done or it just doesn't accomplish the goals. And this is it. It's interesting to me hearing I, it's like I'm having so many conversations with so many different people right now. I'm like, yep, this person and this person, all these names are coming to my head uh, of people who I've dealt with, who I, you know, I'm going to do my best to make sure that they hear this one. This is, this is so good. Okay. I know we are like, no, don't stop. I, I had to, there was just so much more uh, conversation that uh, we got into that to put it all in one episode just would be a very, very long episode. So uh, I, I do my best uh, to keep these within a certain time frame so that you can, you know, listen to them, you know, on the way to work or jogging or et cetera. Uh, and you, you just never know when you're going to run into, you know, that quality content and or an additional person. Remember, I've said it before. I say it again. You're going to be the same today, except for the people you meet and the books you read. And clearly uh, we have met a, an extraordinary person so much so that I, I wanted to release an episode well ahead of time. And I, I just want to remind you one more time, go over to learninvestingnow.com, learninvestingnow.com or raisingprivatecapital.com uh, and 
get started so that you can be uh, so that you can join with us uh, in the mastermind group. If you've ever said to yourself, you know, I'd like to get my iPhone or a technology company, an iPhone app business, or if I wanted to produce a music CD or for or whatever it is that you have said and then goes, if I only had the money, now is the time for you to do something about it, because that's exactly what I'm showing a select group of individuals uh, how to do how to go and get the money for whatever project it is that you're looking for. Anyway, I've enjoyed this particular part of the interview. I know you have, or at least I believe you have. Uh, again, leave a review because this one was, in my opinion, it was good. If you didn't like it, okay, great. Whatever, I tried. Sorry. Uh, in the meantime, don't forget, on Monday, we're going to have the next part, and I guarantee you, you're going to hear that one as well. And I will talk to you guys again soon. Until next time. Thank you for investing your time with Jay Massey and the Cash Flow Diary. When you have a moment, please visit iTunes and leave a positive comment about the show. And go now to our website, CashflowDiary.com, to take advantage of our free business building course, Cash Flow Foundation. Gain the knowledge, understanding, and skill that will teach you how to never need a job again. Until next time. Until next time. Until next time.